Today we're going to hear about the story of Jesus in the Great Controversy with mm -hmm. our guest, Pastor Ivor Myers. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get into the subject matter because I know you have a wealth of information to give us. Before we do that, yeah. I do want our viewers to kind of know who you are, yes. know a little bit about your journey. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a bit about where you came from. Where are you originally from? Okay, well, I'm originally from Jamaica. Uh huh. And uh, I was raised up in New York. Uh, I was uh, part of a four man hip hop group. Uh, the name of the group was called the Boogie Monsters. Bo <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> I was not brought up as a uh, Christian, uh, so I was pretty skeptical of all religions. Um, you know, I thought to myself, if you know, there really is a, a, a true religion, especially in Christianity, why so many different denominations? I thought to myself that Christianity, I mean, that religion was for. Um, you know, whatever the predominant, if someone was religious, it was because that was the predominant religion in their, in their society, their community or whatever. So I just thought, you know, people are what they are because of where they grew up. What about your parents? Where yeah, my parents were uh, um, nominal Christians, but we didn't go to church, you know, at all. Church just wasn't, it was just, what are you? I'm a Christian. Um, but we didn't talk about it at all. It was just super. We went to church. Um, maybe for Christmas, and that would be because someone invited us to go. Mm -hmm. um, but never had a home church or anything like that. So uh, at the age of 19, I was uh, introduced to the book of Daniel uh, in one night. Um, a, an individual, a friend of mine, and actually we had just become friends, and it was a whole group of us. We, we didn't know he, he was even an Adventist. Um, and he began to study, or he began to share with us uh, Daniel chapter 7. One night flipped everything for me. Mm -hmm. Because when I saw the clarity of Daniel chapter 7, remember I have no knowledge of the Bible, nothing. And, and he's breaking this prophecy down and talking about the symbols, what they mean. And I was familiar, and you know, I liked history. So as he was telling me the history, it was like, I know that, I know that. Wait, that's in the Bible? And... Uh, after that, it changed everything. Wow. It changed everything. So I walked away, eventually walked away from that recording contract. And um, my brother, who was in a group with me, walked away from the group as well. And uh, so now we're both pastors. So your brother's a pastor yeah, as well. I absolutely. didn't know that. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. So when you were doing the, the whole hip hop thing, were, was there a point in time in which Without, without the religious piece, before mm -hmm. you even opened Daniel 7, did you ever have any conflict about what you were singing about? Was it, were you ever conflicted about the music itself? Was never conflicted about the music. Um, I did have questions about the future. How so? Um, you know, I, I remember just thinking, uh, you know, what happens to you after you die? You know, and is, mm. if there's no God, then what is life really all about? And I would ask myself these questions, but really, you know, I was at a loss as to look where to look for the answers. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this journey, you know, of being introduced to the book of Daniel, which then began to open up other things, just really had a profound impact um, that led me to walk away from that whole lifestyle. How did you break away from that because so many people and some people that are watching they either are into that lifestyle or know mm -hmm. somebody who is mm -hmm. how do you get away from that because entertainment mm -hmm. is just the entertain to hold yes so how do you get away from that yeah uh for me it was like um dropping a hot potato hmm what do yeah. you mean so the word of God so impacted me that I could not get away fast enough. Wow. Yeah, yeah. When, when I saw what was behind the industry in light of the word of God, it was like, you know, I, there was a relief when I got out of the industry. So you felt a sense of relief getting away from it. Yes. Because it it, it wasn't like, oh man, I have to leave. Oh, all right, pick up your cross and follow me. It was like, 
I was, I had my cross and I was running. I wasn't following. I was like, yeah. What was the reaction of people that knew you before you knew the Lord and after? Yeah, there was, you know, the reaction was mixed. You know, for those who were in the world, they were like, why are you leaving? What are you doing? Where are you going? And uh, for those who were, began to see my, my journey being in the church, even for many of them, there was a surprise reaction like, you know, but you can stay in the industry and like, you know, have an effect and do <laughs> powerful things with the Lord there. And I was like, no. Nah. Isn't that interesting how people think you can stay in it? Yeah. And and now I, I, I do think that there are because um, I used to be in the music business, mm -hmm. but in the jingle, you know, in the studio mm -hmm. world. And there are certain things you can do that are, right. you know, like Charmin bathroom tissue or something mm -hmm. like that. That's mm -hmm. it, it, right. it doesn't impact you spiritually. Right. But but there's certain music and there are even certain jingles that I would mm -hmm. never do mm -hmm. once I came back to the Lord. Right. And so what I guess I'm saying is that there are people who will say you can still be in it mm -hmm. and, you know, let your light shine. But there are certain aspects of it that right. you cannot. It's so seductive. Yeah. You cannot stay there. Yep. Did, was that your uh, experience that Absolutely. you just realized you could not Absolutely. stay there? Yeah. Yeah. It's total realization that I had to come out. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, uh, you know, it was suffocating. Mm -hmm. It was suffocating. Once the Lord came into my life, it was suffocating. So it wasn't even really a choice. It was like, you know get out or or die here you know, so it was that kind of intensity yeah, yeah 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 and so you came out how did your parents respond because you were going to have this big contract mm -hmm. you got out just before that contract yeah how did yeah. your parents respond to that? uh you know at first they thought i was crazy what's going on you know you just got this uh you know a multi-million dollar recording contract and you know you and your brother and your and your friends and what are you guys doing um, now they're happy about it. Mm. Now they're happy about it. So uh, they thought we were crazy. You know, our kids have uh, joined something uh, that is just crazy. And then they themselves joined the movement. Oh, praise the Lord. Yeah. Praise yeah. the Lord. So what would you say to young people who are caught up in to hip hop? One of the things that I've realized is that hip hop is more than just music. It's, it's a culture. culture. Mm hmm. And um, I didn't realize that before we started doing some programming on Dare to Dream about right, it. Right. And then I learned more about it. But what would you say to that young person that's caught up in that lifestyle? What, how can they break away from it? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the Bible says light and darkness cannot dwell together. And that's actually the text. I mean, the, the, the text that someone used. We, we were receiving fan mail one day. And this is when we were still in the group. And someone said, hey, I love you guys, group, and the name of your group, because we had become, all right, we're going to do this music for God. We tried it. So now we were God's hip-hop messengers to the world, you know. <laughs> Did and, you change the songs and Yeah, everything? we changed the songs, and we go into clubs uh, with our Bibles, with great controversy books, all kinds of stuff. Oh, wow. And uh, someone wrote us and said, hey, I appreciate what you guys are doing, but doesn't the Bible say that light and darkness cannot dwell together? Mm. And at first I laughed it off. But it was like, yeah, that hit me, you know, and it was like, OK, so the, the, the principle is light and darkness cannot dwell together. Uh, when the light turns on, darkness has to leave. Mm. And so if Christ is in your life and if the light of the word is shining in your life, you're going to see clearly that you have to do. You have to, you know, take up your cross, follow Christ joyfully and uh, leave behind the things of this world, the things that are opposed, diametrically opposed to the principles of the gospel. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's it's good. the great controversy. Yes, yes. Lived out in each one of our lives. Yes. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the great controversy. Let's talk about Thank it. you for sharing your journey. Yeah. I, I think so many people can benefit from hearing just yeah. where God brought you from. Mm -hmm. And now you are living for him and you're preaching the word yeah. and sharing all this. So 
God has been yeah. really, really good. Yeah. So I've dedicated my life to studying the great controversy mm -hmm. because I saw it unfolding around myself, you know? Mm. That's what led me out of the industry. Okay, this is the great controversy. This is the great controversy. It's happening. This war is unfolding over me right now. And you, some people might not even know what, what is the great controversy? What is So the great controversy is... Um, the theme of the conflict between Christ and Satan. It is a storyline, okay, between this battle between Christ and Satan. And so we just call it the great controversy. Um, <laughs> there's, no, um, there's no greater controversy uh, in existence than the controversy between good and evil. Mm -hmm. We see it played out every day, you know, on the news, in our lives. The great controversy is very real. Um, even Christians don't understand the origin of the great controversy. Hmm. And that's what we want to talk about uh, in our study for today is the origin of the great controversy. Because if you don't know what a war is about, if you don't know how the war began, you can be fighting on the wrong side and not even realize it. That's right. Because you don't understand the principles that are involved in that battle. Mm -hmm. And so understanding how this war unfolded uh, is, is crucial for a Christian. Um, is crucial for those who are seeking to follow the Lamb. Um, but this study is actually called the Great Controversy Part 2. And uh, there's a reason for that. So, um, you want to jump in? Yeah, let's go. Let's jump in. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the entire controversy from the very beginning of time okay. all the way down to the very end of time. Okay. So if you ever doubted, you know, been confused about the Bible and, and the theme of the Bible and what this war is about, we're about to learn about it now. Great. So we're going to try to see how much we can get in, in the time that we have. Okay. So we're going to begin at the beginning. Okay. So let's go to the book of Hebrews chapter one, uh, Hebrews chapter one. And as we're going through this, you know, feel free to stop, say, Hey, got a question on this. Okay. But uh, Hebrews chapter one sets the, the, the foundation for us. Okay. And in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, mm -hmm. hath, it has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the World. worlds. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this verse teaches us that, that God did not just make our world, he made worlds. Mm. Okay, so our world is not the only world uh, that has life on it. He has made other worlds. He, is, he has other, he is the creator and he has other creations. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so we're going to begin, uh, we would summarize this creation by si simply saying heaven. Okay, we know that God uh, is a creator. He created angels in heaven and these angels existed before mankind. OK, um, so the Bible tells us that rebellion began in heaven. Mm -hmm. We'll see that as we go on a little bit further. But I want to first uh, look at the condition of heaven before sin entered. OK. OK. Um, so let's go to the book of Hebrews, chapter four. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Hebrews, chapter four, we're going to take a look at verse nine. Okay. Hebrews chapter four, verse nine, the Bible says there, there remaineth therefore a rest mm -hmm. to the people of God. Mm -hmm. For he that has entered into his rest has also ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So Paul here is writing and he's using this, this analogy between Old Testament Israel and, and us. He's saying just as, if you read Hebrews chapter three, it talks about the children of Israel's journey from Egypt into the promised land. Mm -hmm. And he says some did not enter into that rest because of unbelief. Mm -hmm. So then he says in Hebrews 4, let us labor that, you know, therefore that we don't fall after the same example of unbelief because we're also trying to enter into a rest. Mm -hmm. So the analogy there is they were leaving out of captivity and going where? Into the promised land. Right. The promised land was known as the land of rest. Mm. Okay. So he says, look, we are also trying to enter into a rest. Let us labor, therefore, that we don't 
die in the wilderness, but that we actually enter into the heavenly promised land. Ah, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. It's described as the land of rest. Now, why is it the land of rest? Just think about some reasons. Why would, why would the Bible call it rest? I mean, if a land is at rest, what would that mean? No more war, no more. There's no war, there's no, you know, exactly. That, that's what it is. In fact, if you turn with me to the book of Judges, mm -hmm. chapter 3, mm -hmm. and we're going to see this here. Judges chapter 3 mm -hmm. and verse 30. And uh, the Bible says here, uh, Judges 3 verse 30, mm -hmm. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, Israel, and the land had rest, rest mm -hmm. four score years. So for land to be at rest means that there is no war. Mm -hmm. Everything is in peace and harmony, and particularly with God. So now we can say that, oh yeah, heaven really is the land of rest because there's going to be no what? No war, no, war, no mm -hmm. rebellion, no anything like that. Mm -hmm. Now here's what's interesting. In Hebrews 4, uh, the Greek word used to describe rest is the word sabbatismos. Mm. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it? So God says heaven is my sabbatismos. Mm. my land of rest. And you're automatically thinking, oh, wow, because that reminds me of the Sabbath, the Sabbath right? Mm -hmm. In which we're told to rest. Yeah. So, so heaven then, uh, on a much larger scale, is like an eternal Sabbath. It's a sabbatismos. Mm. Why? Because everything is in harmony to the will of God. So with that definition of heaven, we now take that definition back to the very beginning of time. Mm. Heaven was God's sabbatismos, mm. a place of perfect rest, perfect harmony. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. So far, so good. So far, so good. Now we're introduced to an angel by the name of Lucifer. And we're going to go to the book of Ezekiel 28 to read about this angel. So let's go there. Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. Mm -hmm. We'll begin with verse uh, 14. Okay. And the Bible says here, thou art the anointed, what? Cherub. Cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Verse 18. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquity, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee. And I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Mm. So Lucifer is here introduced to us as an anointed cherub mm -hmm. that covereth. Okay, so what in the world is that? How do we figure out what an anointed cherub that covereth is? Mm -hmm. Well, in order to understand that, we would have to have an understanding of the Old Testament building that God told Moses to build, which mm. is called the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, inside the sanctuary, there was something called the most holy place. Mm -hmm. And in the most holy place, there was something called the Ark of, of the of Covenant. Mm -hmm. Now, on top of the Ark was something called the Mercy Seat. Paul, when he's writing about the sanctuary, tells us that the sanctuary was like a mini model of God's government in heaven. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the sanctuary is God's house or his resting place mm. yeah mm -hmm. that's where god the spirit of god dwelt so the mercy seat as, we, as we're looking at the sanctuary in the old testament the mercy seat would be a symbol of god's throne in heaven right and that mercy seat in the sanctuary rested on top of the law of god which is found in the ark of the covenant mm. so the mercy seat then or god's throne is founded on his what? Mercy. On his mercy, 
which is founded on his law. Mm. In other words, the mercy seat rests on the law of God, mm -hmm. which means his throne in heaven is founded on the law of God. And as long as heaven remained in obedience to God's law, all heaven was sabotismos. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, on top of this mercy seat, there were two angels. The Bible says, in fact, let's look at it in Exodus 25 and verse 30. So we're just laying the foundation yes. here, okay? Exodus 25 and verse 30, mm -hmm. or verse 20, rather. The Bible says, And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering mm -hmm. the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one toward another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. Mm. So we just read that Lucifer was a covering cherub. What this tells us then is that Lucifer was one of the two angels that stood closest to the presence of God. Mm -hmm. His job description in heaven was to show the holiness of the law of God. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, you need to say that again. Okay. His job description in heaven, because we just saw it here in a sanctuary. Right. He covers the mercy seat and the ark. Right. To cover means to, to show the holiness of. Right. So from this, we learn that Lucifer's job description in heaven was to show the holiness of the law of God. Wow. That was his job description. He's the covering cherub. Mm -hmm. But the Bible goes further. It says he was the anointed cherub that covereth. Okay, so what does it mean to be anointed? Mm -hmm. um, turn with me to the book of Leviticus chapter 8. Leviticus chapter 8 mm -hmm. and verse 12. Again, we're just laying the foundation here. Mm -hmm. Leviticus chapter 8, verse 12. The Bible says this. And he poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to what? Sanctify, Sanctify him. him. So to anoint mm -hmm. means to what? Sanctify. Sanctify. All right? Mm -hmm. So when you're sanctified, it means the presence of God is in you. Mm. Because God is the one that sanctifies us, right? Mm -hmm. So to anoint means to sanctify, okay? To be sanctified means the presence of God is in you. And if the presence of God is in you, dwelling in you, then that makes you a sanctuary. Mm. So to be sanctified means to be a sanctuary. That's, that's very deep. Lucifer then was a sanctuary hmm. because he was the anointed or sanctified cherub. In other words, this is revealing that the presence of God, remember Lucifer's name, light bearer, mm -hmm. whose light was he bearing? Hmm. Whose light was he reflecting? His own? God's light. No, right. God's light. Mm -hmm. Some people say he was God's armor bearer. Mm. God's armor is light. So, so now we can begin to understand when the Bible says that Lucifer defiled his sanctuaries. Oh, hmm. when he sinned, he defiled himself. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. was defiling himself. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Lucifer, he's a covering cherub. He's the anointed cherub that covers. But the Bible says that he sinned. So now our question is, what is sin? Mm -hmm. And according to 1 John 3, 4, mm -hmm. sin is what? Transgression, of, Transgression the of the law. So the very law that Lucifer was supposed to be showing the holiness of, mm -hmm. he ends up turning against. All right? So when he sins, what is sin? Transgression of the law, law mm -hmm. right? When he sins, he now becomes a lawbreaker. Right. Okay. So here's the question. Was Lucifer cast out of heaven because he sinned? What do you think? Hmm. Well, he broke the law. Broke the law. Sin is the transgression of the sin law. Sin is the transgression of the and law. And the Bible said he was a sinner. Mm -hmm. So, but you're asking, I think, somehow I think this yeah. is a trick question. It's a trick question. <laughs> yes. yes. So, was he kicked out of heaven because 
he broke the law. Yeah, in other words, was his salvation, you know, he, was he lost because he sinned? No. I think he could have, he, he could have asked for forgiveness for that sin. Okay. Now, how do we know he could have asked for forgiveness for that sin? I don't know. Tell me. <laughs> well, on top of the Ark of the Covenant was something called the the mercy, mercy seat. seat. Oh, okay. huh, wait a minute. Why would God have a mercy seat in heaven before sin ever even entered? Why would there even be a need for a mercy why would seat there before be, sin? Huh? Absolutely. Why huh. would there be a need for mercy? Could it be that the plan of salvation was not an afterthought? Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could it be that that God foresaw that there was going to be a need for mercy? OK, so if God foresaw that there was going to be a need for mercy, then we know that if God is the same yesterday, today and forever, then he must have extended what? Mercy, mercy to Lucifer. In other words, he must have borne long mm -hmm. with Lucifer. Mm hmm. Which means that Lucifer, in essence, was not thrown out of heaven because he sinned, but because he rejected mercy. Mercy. Oh. Yeah. Because he rejected huh. mercy. You see, mankind is not going to be lost necessarily because he sinned. Because look, if, he's, if we're lost because we sinned, then all are lost. Right, right. Man is lost. Man, those who are lost will be lost, not because they necessarily sinned. Yes, sin is involved, but because they rejected mercy. mercy. Huh. So it is a conscious decision then to, you know, you're not just propelled by your sin. You are consciously rejecting mercy. Why did Lucifer reject God's mercy? What wrong have I done? Pride, right? Pride. Mm -hmm. I didn't do anything wrong. Wait, you want me to? Because in order to accept mercy, we got to acknowledge that we've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. Lucifer was unwilling to acknowledge that he had done anything wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So do you remember when Peter came to Jesus and said, um, Jesus, if my enemy sins against me, if someone sins against me, how often shall I forgive them? Seven times. Mm -hmm. And what did Jesus say? Seventy times. Seven. Seventy times seven. Mm -hmm. All right. Now watch this. So let's just say that 70 times 7 is a symbolic number representing mercy being extended. Hmm. Forgiveness. So let's just take that principle back to heaven. We know then that there must have been a period of time. Let's just call it 70 times 7. Mm -hmm. In which God extended mercy to Lucifer. And after that time period, whatever that time period was ended, mercy was no longer available to him. Mm. So, so there was kind of like it, a probationary period yeah, then? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let's just call that period 70 times 7. You multiply 70 times 7, it's 490, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So let's just say 70 times 7. So whatever that time period was, we don't know how long, but we know that that 70 times 7, the term Jesus used to talk about the length of forgiveness before salvation is cut off, mm -hmm. that was extended to Lucifer in heaven. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, during this time, I can imagine that there must have been warnings given to Lucifer. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right. Oh, because yeah. God is the same yesterday and for today and forever. Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. um, I can I can imagine that a message must have gone forward to Lucifer. That was probably something like, listen, fear God. And give glory to him. Hmm. He's the creator of all things. Fear God and give glory. Lucifer. Don't glorify yourself. Right. Fear God and give glory. Glory to him. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're thinking ahead of me, you're probably beginning to think, man, some of this sounds familiar. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The title of this study is The Great Controversy Part Two. two. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at right now is The Great Controversy Part One. Mm -hmm. So, OK, there's a 70 times seven then in heaven. Mm -hmm. Right. We don't know how long it was, but it was a time where God is extending mercy to Lucifer. And during that time, a message. Listen, man. You can't be on glorifying yourself. Glorify God. 
He's the creator, not you. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that Lucifer ultimately rejects this message, right? And in rejecting this message, um, open war comes to heaven. Lucifer's probation is now sealed. He's rejected it. I don't want mercy. I haven't done anything wrong. But not only has he rejected it, he has spread the toxin. Okay. Now. That toxic thought he's yeah. spread to other beings. Okay. Let's call that first time period in heaven a time of mercy. Okay. Okay. So let's just say time of mercy, right? Mm -hmm. Now that time of mercy is now followed by a time of war. Mm. Okay. So we're now having a, a second time period, a time of war. What kind of war? You know, yeah. when, when you think about war, yeah. Let, you think of weapons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What were the weapons? I mean, I know that yeah. it's not yeah. here specifically listed, but mm -hmm. what do you think were the weapons? We're about to look at that right now. Okay. What, what happened in this war? Okay. Um, but let's say this. When war came to heaven, mm -hmm. something was disrupted. What was it? The sabato or the... The sabotismos. The sabotismos. So wait. Lucifer's rebellion in heaven broke. Oh, come on now. Come on, I see where you're going. I Lucifer's see where you're going. Lucifer's rebellion in heaven uh -huh. broke the state of rest. It, let me say it this way, it changed the sabbatismos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It broke the sabbatismos. Mm -hmm. Now, let's describe this war. Lucifer wants something now, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So um, here's what he wants. He's, he is seeking now the place of the Holy Father. Hmm. He, he's no longer content no. to be the anointing, covering yeah. cherub. Yeah. Now he wants to usurp yeah. that whole position. Yeah. So, so listen carefully. He, he wants to be the Holy Father. Mm. There's only one Holy Father. That's right. But he wants the title of Holy Father. Mm -hmm. He wants to be called the Holy Father, number one. Hmm. Number two, uh, he wants to sit on the sides of the north. In fact, let's go here. Let's go over to Isaiah chapter 14, mm -hmm. and we're going to read about what Lucifer wanted to do. So Isaiah chapter 14. Mm -hmm. And uh, notice with me verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? By the way, there must have been, after Lucifer's open rebellion, there must have been a second message that went forth to the angels. Lucifer has fallen. So first message, fear God and give glory to him. Lucifer, don't glorify yourself. Give glory to God. Lucifer rejects it. So now a message goes forward. Lucifer is fallen. Mm. Fallen. Mm -hmm. Man, this sounds familiar. <laughs> kind of like Babylon. Oh, kind of like the second angel's message. Mm -hmm. Wow. Huh. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. But we're looking at the controversy in heaven right now, not on earth. Right. Right. So look. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, which art, um, how art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. Mm -hmm. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Mm -hmm. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Mm -hmm. So who does he want to be like? He wants to be like the Holy Father. He wants to sit in the place of the Holy Father. Okay, so think about this. A time of mercy. 70 times 7, mm -hmm. followed by a time of war. Now, in this war, Lucifer now goes into open rebellion. He, he b rejects God's law, or let's put it this way. Let me use these words. He thinks to change times and laws. <laughs> uh -huh. He wants to sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Mm-hmm. He wars against the saints, I mean the angels <laughs> of God. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah? Uh, he casts down the truth to the ground. He practices and prospers. He uproots one-third, so remember that number, right? Mm -hmm. he, he uproots one-third 
of the angels. Mm -hmm. He speaks blasphemous words against the Most High. Mm -hmm. Wow. Like if you're a student of Bible prophecy, you're beginning to say to yourself, these words sound familiar. Mm -hmm. He magnifies himself against the prince of the host. And all this would, we would describe as the time of war in heaven. Mm. where he is not. Now remember, the reason why he's able to deceive one third of angels is because he, he's not doing, he's not presenting himself as an evil being. Right. He's presenting himself as someone who's righteous, someone who's doing good, not doing evil. Mm -hmm. That's why one third of the congregation, remember, I was sitting on the mound of the congregation. Mm -hmm. What's a congregation? It's a church. Mm -hmm. So there was a church in heaven, the church of angels, and one third of those angels were deceived because Lucifer had the appearance of doing good. Hmm. I want to be the Holy Father. But he thinks it's changed times and laws. He uh, wars against the saints of the Most High or the angels of the Most High. He's doing all these things that are seeking to undermine the kingdom of God. Right. All right. So we see so far there was a first a first message, fear God and give glory to him. Must have been followed by a second message. Listen, Lucifer has fallen. And then I can just, you know, if God is God, then there would have had to have been a final message, right? Mm -hmm. If any angel sides with Lucifer, worships the dragon, <laughs> mm -hmm. he's going to be cast out into outer darkness. Oh, here are the angels that keep the commandments of God. Mm -hmm. So... As a result of this, there's war in heaven, and God realizes that heaven must be cleansed. So there is a cleansing that occurs in which Lucifer is removed from heaven. He is cast out of heaven. Okay, so let's recap that. Three time periods, mm -hmm. a time of mercy, mm -hmm. a time of war, Mm -hmm. And then a time of cleansing. And when the cleansing is over and Lucifer and his angels are cast out, guess what returns to heaven? Sabbatismos. Ah. Wow. So the whole idea is to, you, know, you have the, the time of mercy, mm -hmm. right? Then Remember you that. You have three time periods. Right. Three time periods. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Three time periods. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> a time of mercy, uh -huh. a time of war, uh -huh. a time of cleansing mm -hmm. before Lucifer is sent out into a desolate place. Hmm. <laughs> Some deep stuff. Yeah. All right. So Lots of parallels. There is an amazing parallel, which is why this study is called The Great Controversy Part Two. Mm -hmm. Because we're looking at The Great Controversy part one. Mm -hmm. So here's a question. Where was Lucifer cast out? Okay. Mm -hmm. Where was Lucifer cast out? So let's go to Revelation chapter 12. Mm -hmm. And we're going to read here Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, and there was war in heaven. Mm -hmm. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the where? Earth. Earth and his angels were cast out with him. Mm -hmm. Now, I usually say to people, how many of you are excited about this verse? You know, that Satan was cast out. And people are like, praise the Lord. And I'm like, no, but seriously, though, how many of you are excited about this verse? How many of you ask, Lord, why did you have to cast them down here? here? Right. Why right. here? Right. Okay. But I want to show you what 2 Peter says. Mm -hmm. So go to sec with me to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Mm -hmm. The Bible says here, For if God spared not the angels that, what? Sin. Sinned, but cast them down to where? Hell. Hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto what? Judgment. All right, so Peter says that the devil and his angels were cast down to hell. John says they were cast down to earth. the earth. So the question is, is there a conflict here? Well, the word here for hell is the Greek word tartaru, and it simply means an abyss. Mm. So what is an abyss? It's a place without form mm -hmm. and void. Mm. So where did God cast Lucifer? Hmm. 
it wasn't on this earth where people were. Right. It was on this earth before, before people. Mm. Absolutely. It was a desolate place, mm -hmm. like a wilderness. So remember that term, wilderness, desolate place. In Genesis 1, 1, and the earth was without form, form and, void. and void. So God basically cast Lucifer to this earth mm -hmm. because it is here that he was going to be judged. Mm. Okay. So the question is, why didn't God judge him up there? Why didn't God just judge him right then and there? Well, there's another principle in the Bible that we're going to bring into our story to give us more insight. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 19. In Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 16 through 19. Um, and I'm just going to summarize it. Okay. Uh, the Bible basically says there that if controversy arose between two parties, mm -hmm. there had to be a third party that would serve as a jury, if you will. Mm. And that's only fair. You know, if you and I have an issue and you say, you know, I'll see you in court. Mm -hmm. Imagine going to court and... I'm the judge, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Or you're the judge. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, that's not fair. Mm -hmm. I I'm bringing the case against her. Or you're saying you're, I'm bringing the case against him. Neither of us can serve as the judge. It just wouldn't be fair. And God, because he's a fair God, listen, in heaven, how many sides were there? Two. God and his angels, the devil and his angels. Mm -hmm. Only two sides. Mm -hmm. So who is the third party mm. that God is going to use as the jury to judge angels? Mankind. Wow. Wow. God is going to use humanity. And in fact, 1 Corinthians 6 Mm -hmm. Verses uh, one and two, one to three, one through three. Mm -hmm. It says, "Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world?" It goes on to say, "Do you not know that we shall judge angels?" angels? Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. So you mean part of the reason that God created humanity? Not the whole reason, but part of the reason is that we were to be jurors. Huh. Oh, wow. Wow. When a jury selected, a couple of things. Number one, a juror uh, could not have been around at the time of the crime. That's right. <laughs> Guess where man was when Satan sinned in heaven? Not Nowhere. around. Weren't even created. Right. Number two, a juror must be a law-abiding citizen. <laughs> <laughs> God writes the law of God on Adam and Eve's heart. They are law-abiding citizens of the kingdom of heaven. So Adam and Eve would have originally been judges? Wow, I never so would have look, connected that. If you're a criminal and you have access to a jury that can condemn you, what are you going to try to do? Bribe, Bribe them. the Get jury. Get to them, yeah. yeah right? Yeah. When God created Lucifer, he made him the anointed cherub that covereth. He was anointed, meaning sanctified. And God says, look, I sanctify you. But Lucifer began to trust in himself. I can sanctify myself. That was his argument. I can be like God without following God's law. Mm -hmm. That's what deceived angels. I don't need a law in order to be like God. You know, God doesn't have the, the market on righteousness. We can be righteous and determine what is right for ourselves. We don't need a law telling us how to be right. We can self-sanctify. Mm. Lucifer's argument was an argument of self-sanctification. God doesn't have the market. I'm not saying let's be evil. I'm just saying we can determine for ourselves what is right and wrong. Wow. So that's what he tells the angels. That's what deceives angels. Angels are not going to be like, Lucifer wasn't like, let's go, you know, be crooked. Right. Like, yeah, let, no, right. the argument was an argument of righteousness. Look, I'm just saying that it's time for change in God's government. God is, we don't need God telling us what to do, where to go. We can be righteous on our own. Kind of like Korah's rebellion. Oh, Korah. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Moses, what are you doing? All the mm -hmm. people are holy. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so I know we're running out of time here for this first segment. But it's good. It's good stuff. In when God creates Adam and Eve, guess what he does? He makes them sanctuaries. Mm. The presence of God dwelling in them. in them. And as you can see, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, all good. And what does he do? 
he takes a slice of heaven, sabbatismos, and gives it to man in the seventh day and says, this Sabbath is a symbol of your connection to heaven because everything on earth is in harmony with the will of God. Wow. The Sabbath was that mini slither uh -huh. of the government of heaven. Hmm. And he says, I'm giving you this because you and earth are in submission to my will. All right, so I guess we'll pause here. No, we go have, ahead. We, okay, we, we have just keep going. More. Yeah, well, right. we, well, we're going to, in just a second. Yes, okay. 30 so, seconds. So, um, Lucifer says, wait a minute, are these the ones that are going to judge me? Mm -hmm. Because he realizes if he can corrupt the jury, then he can stop the court case. Now mm -hmm. that's, that yeah. is deep. Corrupt the jury. Yes. And stop the court case. No trial. Who are you going to get to judge me now? That's right. These guys are on my side. That's right. I got them. Yep. I've got them. I hope that you are enjoying this as much as I am. This is so rich, such rich information. Yeah. What we're seeing here, and the point I wanted to mention actually earlier, um, when God creates Adam and Eve, he gives them the Sabbath I talked about as a sign, a slither of the atmosphere of heaven. Mm -hmm. He's saying earth and, uh, and heaven are in harmony. I'm giving you the Sabbath. Uh, as a demonstration of this, that all is good. It is, it is like heaven on earth. However, he also gives them the Sabbath for a very powerful reason. You see in Ezekiel 20, uh, verse 12 and 20, it talks about God giving the Sabbath as a sign that you may know that I am the Lord that sanctifies you. Mm -hmm. Don't make the same mistake Lucifer made in heaven thinking he could sanctify himself. Mm. I sanctify you. The Sabbath is a reminder to you of my power. I'm the creator. I sanctify. I glorify. It's, it's me. It's not you. You rest in me. All is good as long as you remain submitted to my will, as long as you rest in me. So that Sabbath was to be a, a, a reminder that we cannot sanctify ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, it is not God's law, the keeping of the law that saves us, you know, on this side of sin. Right. It's his mercy that saves us. Right. But in order to be under his mercy, we have to be keeping the law because the mercy is above the Ark of the Covenant. So if I want to be under mercy, that's why the commandment says showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my, my commandments. commandments. So it's not commandment keeping that saves us because once we sinned, there's no amount of, okay, I'll do better now. Yes. That will save us. It is only God's mercy that can save us. Yes. But God, God will extend his mercy only to those who acknowledge I've done wrong. Help me not to do that anymore. Mm. Lucifer failed to do that. What wrong? So Lucifer knows if he can get us to just break at just one of God's commandments and never confess it, never claim to have done wrong, we're in the same boat as he is. Huh. So he sees that mankind's the jury. He's like, well, hmm, is they, these the ones that ought to judge me? Are these the judges? Okay. Because remember, God had told him in heaven, <clears throat> I'm going to lay you before kings that they may behold you. So Lucifer's like, what kings are you going to use to judge? Don't you see all heaven is polarized into two sides? Who are you going to use to judge me? So now he's like, are these the kings? Mm. Okay. So you know what he does? And I love putting it this way. He doesn't go up to Eve and, and say to Eve, hey, Eve, do you want to be evil? Oh. No, he says, Eve, you can be like God. Mm -hmm. It's the very thing he told the angels in heaven. We can be like God without obeying God's will. Now, I want you to just pause for a moment and imagine this unfolding from the perspective of heaven. Imagine angels looking down and going, we've seen this before. Mm. This is the very thing Lucifer did in heaven, and now he's trying to bring it to earth. He's trying to corrupt the very ones who are going to judge him. He says to Eve, you can be as gods. The Hebrew word gods, it also, it's a Elohim. It also means judges. You want to be a good judge, Eve? 
eat from this tree, then you'll be a really good judge. <laughs> Eve eats from the tree and gives to her husband with her. They both eat and they lose their position as jurors. Mm, because they're no longer... Absolutely. A, you just they, they disqualify don't yourself. Right. They don't satisfy the <clears throat> criteria. A absolutely. Uh -huh. So when God comes to the garden, Adam and Eve do something that is quite... Di Adam and Eve are given mercy. The lamb covers the clothing skin. I mean, animal is slain, covers them. Adam, in a roundabout way, confessed that he did something wrong. Eve, too. In a roundabout way. <laughs> right, they right, made right. me do it. But right. they acknowledged that they did wrong. Mm -hmm. The difference between man having a second chance, having mercy extended, and Lucifer, his salvation, his chance being cut off, is that man acknowledged his wrong when Lucifer and the angels did not. Mm. It's not that God was like, you know what, I'll, I'll give man, you know, a chance and work with him. But Lucifer, no, I don't like angels. You're just lost. You knew too much. You're just lost. No. If God is the same yesterday and today and forever, then he had to have extended mercy to Lucifer. Yes. So the only difference between man and angel is that man acknowledged his wrong. Yes, the woman made me do it in a roundabout way. The woman, yes, the devil made me do it. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Thus, the plan of salvation is instituted or set off for Adam and Eve. What is the plan? To restore mankind to being sound jurors who know the difference between right and wrong, who are law-abiding citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Wow. That's the entire plan of salvation. The devil's like, you're going to use these guys to judge me? God says, I'm going to use them to judge you. What, what are you talking about? Watch. So he initiates the plan of salvation and he's going to restore mankind to being jurors, which is why we read in Revelation chapter 20 mm -hmm. that at the resurrection, uh, at, uh, um, at the second coming, the saints are given judgment. Judgment is given unto them. Mm -hmm. It's in Revelation 20 that the saints enter jury duty. <laughs> okay. Right. And so for 1000 years, what are we going to be doing in heaven? We're going to be judging angels. Okay. So let's go back. Wow. We have just seen the great controversy part one. Right. Now we're going to look at the great controversy part two. Okay. So <clears throat> plan of salvation begins to unfold on planet earth. Um, God is going to raise up Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they become a father of a great nation, the nation of Israel. Israel goes into captivity uh, in, in Egypt, and then Moses delivers them out of that captivity. And uh, then God gives them the sanctuary. And the sanctuary is designed to teach them that God's plan of salvation is all within that. In other words, the way to me is through the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. My entire government is in the sanctuary. When you look at the sanctuary and you see a covering cherub, you're going to understand that Lucifer used to be one of those covering cherubs. You're going to understand his job description in heaven. You're going to understand why he fell, what he broke. And you're going to understand how you as a sinner can move from being out of my presence back to my throne. Hmm. So he gives them the sanctuary as a blueprint, I like to call it. It is the blueprint of the plan of salvation. I call it God's GPS, the gospel plan of salvation. Yes. All right. It's going to direct me on how to get back to the throne of God. So we're not going to get into all that now. That's a really heavy part of the study that is beautiful, but we're going to skip that. Okay. We're just going to lay that to the <laughs> side for now. So God gives Israel this blueprint, the sanctuary, and they're supposed to prepare the world for the coming of Jesus, but they begin to mess up. They begin to fumble. They begin to rebel against God. Mm -hmm. Now, Lucifer, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Israel was to be as God's anointed. Okay, so Israel was supposed to be as God's anointed. I'm using you in a very special sense to take my light to the world. Mm -hmm. They were to be God's armor bearer. Mm -hmm. Wow, that sounds familiar. Because that was Lucifer's job description in heaven. Mm -hmm. To bear the light. 
So God says, uh, uh, um, uh, and by the way, we know that humanity is going to take the place of Lucifer and the fallen angels right. in heaven, right? Right. So here you have Israel beginning to mess up so bad that God sends them into Babylonian captivity. Here we're introduced to a prophet named Daniel. Mm -hmm. That prophet Daniel introduces us to three time prophecies. The first one is found in Daniel chapter 9. So let's go there. Okay. Daniel chapter 9. <clears throat> I want you to tell me what jumps out at you. Now remember, they have gone into rebellion. Mm -hmm. God says, okay, God could cut them off immediately, but he doesn't do that. In Daniel 9, here's what it says. Daniel 9, verse 24. Daniel is in vision. He sees an angel. Mm -hmm. And the angel comes to him. The Bible says here, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Okay. We're not going to get too deep into this. We're just going to summarize this prophecy. Mm -hmm. Daniel one of, the, uh, one of the Israelites is receiving this vision. Mm -hmm. And the vision is basically saying, listen, you guys have messed up. I'm giving, you, I'm giving you some time to get it right. My son, the Messiah, is going to be coming at the end of this time period. And if you reject him, then that's it. That's it. I'm going to take the plan from you and I'm going to give it to someone else. Mm. How long was that prophecy? 70 weeks. 70 times. Oh. Seven. Wait a minute now. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> wait a minute. Yes. 70 times seven. Imagine angels in heaven looking down and saying, we've seen this before. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. So Israel is being extended this time of mercy, mercy. Yes. At the end of which, if they do not receive the Son of God, wow. they're going to be cut off. Can you imagine angels in heaven saying, will they do what Lucifer did in heaven? Or will they accept the Messiah? I mean, imagine the intrigue. In other words, <clears throat> this 70-week prophecy, for us, we're like intrigued. But we think it's just us. Mm -hmm. This prophecy was just as important to angels in heaven as it was hmm. to us on earth. Mm -hmm. Because they are looking and saying, we've seen this before. Mm -hmm. God is extending 70 times 7. Now, by the way, Lucifer thought that, he was, that his salvation was secure. Hmm. You know, there's nothing I can do to, to be lost. So I'm just going to go out and do everything that I can do. Well, there was no frame of reference for that either. Absolutely, because sin had never been. Right. Right. But Israel is now being told, listen, you have 70 weeks, 70 times seven. Jesus used the exact term. How often shall my, you know, my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times? Jesus said no. Mm -hmm. 70 times seven mm -hmm. or 490. Mm-hmm. On, in this instance, it's 490 years. Mm -hmm. In heaven, it was just 70 times, whatever that was. The time period was a time of mercy. So what happens when Jesus comes? Does Israel accept or reject him as the Messiah? Reject. They reject him. Mm -hmm. And as a result of them rejecting him, guess what? Their house is left unto them desolate. desolate. Wait a minute. Lucifer's sanctuary mm. in heaven, when he did this, guess what happened to him? His house was left unto him desolate. desolate. It almost seems as if 
a mirror image of what happened in heaven mm. is now happening on earth. Mm-hmm. Wait a minute. This is the great controversy. Two. Part two. Mm-hmm. So, the plan of salvation moves from just Israel in the Old Testament after the 70 weeks to spiritual Israel. That means Jew or Gentile is now, and not really now, but it is emphasized that it is Jew or Gentile. The gospel is to go to all the world, right? Um, by the way, on the day of Pentecost, remember fire fell from heaven? Mm-hmm. Uh, in this prophecy of the 70 weeks, it says that the most holy was to be anointed. Uh, the term is Tahagiai. And it not only means, you know, holy place or sanctuary, uh, it also means saint. Saint. So here's a question. Remember when God made man, he made him as a sanctuary. Mm-hmm. But when man sinned, he had defiled mm-hmm. his sanctuary. Mm-hmm. And the presence of God leaves. So God's plan is to once again make man mm-hmm. a sanctuary, a dwelling place for him. That's the ultimate plan of salvation. So when the children of Israel got the sanctuary in the Old Testament, they were to see that as God's ideal of how he was eventually going to use man as his tabernacle. I want to dwell in you. Mm -hmm. And in order to dwell in you, the sanctuary must be cleansed. Oh. Okay, I'm getting some context here. Yeah, yeah. To what the whole plan of salvation is all about. The whole plan of salvation is about cleansing the sanctuary from sin. Right? Mm -hmm. So, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls. And remember what happened? Well, I'm not going to say what happened yet. Let me tell you this. Uh In the Old Testament, the way that um, it, it was signified that the presence of God was now dwelling in the sanctuary was that fire rested on top of the temple, yeah. on top of the tent. Mm-hmm. That signified that God was now dwelling in the sanctuary. Mm-hmm. It showed the presence of God with them. On the day of Pentecost, fire falls from the sky. Mm. And it rests. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so what's happening is that in the New Testament, you now have... 3,000, on the day of Pentecost, Mm -hmm. you have 3,000 tents, sanctuaries being set up. And in the Old Testament, there was only one. Yes. In the New Testament, if Satan had hair, he would be pulling it out. (laughs) Because in the Old Testament, he's after one sanctuary. Right. In the New Testament, 3,000. Mm-hmm. So now we begin to understand, whoa, the mission in the New Testament is to make sanctuaries. In fact, the man that God uses and calls to be the missionary to the the Gentiles, his name is Paul. Mm -hmm. You know what Paul was? A tent maker. Oh. He was a tent maker. Yeah, yeah. God chooses a man who's a tent maker <laughs> to take the gospel into all the world. In other words, it's like, Paul, I need you to go build tents. Every time you win a soul to the Lord, you just set up another sanctuary. You just set up another tent. And you have to know how the sanctuary is built in order to make a sanctuary. Mm. You have to know that it has to have an altar of uh, a, a Ark of the Covenant. Mm-hmm. It has to have an uh, altar of incense. It has to have the labor representing baptism. It has to have the altar of sacrifice re- representing the cross. It has to have the candlestick, let your light shine. It has to have, a ta- have the table of showbread, uh, the word of God, give us their daily bread. A true sanctuary has those articles of furniture dwelling in it. Mm-hmm. So now the gospel plan is to multiply sanctuaries all over the planet. So the replication of sanctuaries is the goal. Absolutely. Everywhere. Everywhere. Instead of just one, as in the Old Testament, now you're talking the world. Know you not that you are the temple Temple. of the Holy Ghost? That's right. And that the Spirit of God dwells in you? Okay, so what happens? 
Lucifer, Satan is angry. He's like, I got to break these tents down. I got to destroy these tents. And so he sends Rome. Rome, we're going to just, let's just persecute them, tear these tents down, throw these tents to the lions. But what happens is that every time a tent gets torn down, five more pop up. Mm. So Lucifer has to come up with an ingenious plan. I got to do something else. I got to figure out some other way to attack the sanctuary. This introduces us to the second of three time prophecies. It's called the 1260 year prophecy. Mm -hmm. In this prophecy, a power by the name of the little horn is introduced. Okay. So let's talk about this little horn for a moment. Mm -hmm. We don't need to identify the little horn. Let's just say this, this little horn does the following things. The little horn uproots three out of 10 horns in the book of Daniel. That's roughly one third. Oh, wait a minute. Where did the one third, right? Didn't Lucifer right. in heaven uproot a third of the angels? Mm -hmm. Huh, maybe it's just coincidence. Okay, well, this little horn also wants the title of Holy Father. Wait a minute. Didn't Lucifer want to be the Holy Father in heaven? Hmm. The little horn thinks to change times and laws. Wait a minute. Didn't Lucifer want to change hmm. times and laws in heaven? The little horn persecutes the saints of the Most High. Wait a minute. Didn't Lucifer war against the saints of the Most High? The little horn wants to sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Wait a minute, didn't Lucifer want to sit on the sides of the north, on the Mount of the Congregation? In other words, as we look at the actions of this little horn, they are a perfect mirror image of what Lucifer did in heaven after that time of mercy had passed. Mm. It's almost as though planet Earth is going through and I won't use the term an instant replay, mm -hmm. but a replay mm -hmm. of what occurred in heaven. Mm -hmm. If you want to know how can people look at, a, at you know, this power and look at it as holy and be deceived by this little horn, just think about angels in heaven looking at Lucifer saying, come on, this guy is a true believer in God. He's not saying let's be evil. He's just saying there are other ways to do things other than, you know, yeah, you know, the word of God, and we can start new traditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One third, if one third of angels were deceived in heaven, intelligent angels, it shouldn't be a mystery to us how people on earth are being deceived by this little horn power that is claiming to be speaking on behalf of God, while at the same time is really undermining the very principles of God. Wow. Look at the, the parallels. Look at the pa I, um, I have never, never seen it this way before. Let me say this. At the end of the 70 week prophecy, mm -hmm. angels in heaven must be convinced. We get it now. Before there may have been a question, there probably was a question because Lucifer never claimed evil, mm -hmm. never claimed evil. And in fact, on earth before the cross, he's still saying, look, I'm telling you, mankind is suffering because of God's unfair uh, uh, requirements upon them. I'm just trying to show you angels that all these things happening on earth are a result of God, not me. Mm -hmm. And his arguments have to be so convincing that even angels in heaven are going, all right, we need, and that's why God allowed time right. to let this principle unfold. Right. So now when Jesus comes and the angels in heaven watch a repeat of what happened in heaven, mm -hmm. they're like, okay, now we get it. Mm -hmm. You know, at first we thought, okay, maybe there's some things we don't get. But when they see Christ being put to death on the cross, they're like, now we get it. And God has to let it play out. He has to let it play out. He cannot interrupt it. That's right. It has to play out. So this great controversy theme is as much a revelation for the angels mm. as it is for us. Mm -hmm. 
right? So that's the time of mercy. Now when we get to the time of war, remember the time of war in heaven? Right. Now we've got the same thing being repeated. It's almost as though the angels are saying, wait a minute, sin, wherever it goes, leads to the same result. Right. Look at this. Right. What happened in heaven is unfolding in the very same way on earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we just covered two time periods, time of mercy, time of war. Now, and what you've been telling us so far has been so rich because what you're showing is this whole parallel between what happened in heaven mm -hmm. and what's happening here. Yeah. And I was thinking, you know, there is such a proliferation nowadays of Satanism mm -hmm. and people worshiping Satan. And I've, I've even heard of people having these, you know, churches where they sing actual hymns to Satan. Why? Because he wants to ascend right. mm -hmm. above the Most High. Yes. He wants to, to be worshiped. Sit. And he even had the temerity to say to Jesus, fall down and, and worship, worship me. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. his thing is worship. And God's thing is worship, not because God is some, you know, cosmic egomaniac, right. mm -hmm. but there's even something that happens in us yeah. when we worship. There's, there are yes. things, neurological changes mm -hmm. that go on in the brain mm -hmm. when we worship. Yep. So this is, this is all so rich because it's actually showing us, not that we didn't know the character of Satan right. before, right. but it's, it's really contrasting yeah. the characters of Satan and God and how God has been so merciful yeah. and how he extended mercy. Yes. Just like with that mercy yep. seat, he yep. extended mercy. And then after a certain period of time, that time is up. Mm -hmm. Yep. What does a merciful God do? He extends mercy. That's it. But what does a just God do? Extends he is, justice. Extends justice. Mm -hmm. So he is extending mercy and giving justice and, and put into effect right. the plan of salvation mm -hmm. for us mm -hmm. that we don't have to be under sin anymore. Right. We are saved by grace through faith yes. in Jesus. Absolutely. I think I'm preaching right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But I really, I, I'm so excited because this lesson that you're giving, this, this teaching that you're giving us is really, it's rich, it's yeah. substantive because it's showing us again who this great God is mm -hmm. that we serve mm -hmm. and who yeah. is the enemy yeah. of souls. So sin, wherever it occurs, will lead to the same result. Yes. That's the, that's the point that we're looking at. Yes. Look, look at what happened in heaven now. There's the earth. If you demonstrate your principles, Adam and Eve don't have to listen to you, but if they choose to listen to you, and we see the same thing unfolding, sin wherever it occurs leads to the same result. Mm. That's what we're seeing. So um, as we look at this, we looked at the two time prophecies so far, mm -hmm. the, the 70 weeks, mm -hmm. the 1260, 1260. Mm -hmm. and see that both of these in, in, in shadow form were reflected in heaven. A time of mercy followed by a time of war. Now, what's, what was the time of war followed by? A time of cleansing. cleansing. Mm -hmm. Is there another prophecy in the book of Daniel? The final prophecy. Mm. Yes, it's called the 2300 day prophecy. On the 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be Cleanse. cleansed. Why? And we know that at the close of that cleansing, something's going to happen to Lucifer. Mm. Wow. Our mirror image. So let's talk about the cleansing very quickly. So the cleansing of the sanctuary really boils down to something very simple. You see, in the Old Testament, the way that the sanctuary was cleansed, um, the, you know, when a sinner sinned, he would put his hands on the head of the animal. He would transfer the sin from himself to the head of that animal. Then the animal was killed. Blood was taken at the sanctuary and either put on the altar um, uh, in the sanctuary or on the altar in the outer court. And every day this, this would occur, sins were piling up in the sanctuary. On the Day of Atonement, that day the high priest was cleansing the sanctuary from all the sins that had been piling up there throughout the year. He would take those sins and place them on the head of a live scapegoat who was not killed. So this is not a sacrifice. 
this live scapegoat would now bear the sins that were in the temple into a desolate place, mm. a desolate place, an mm. abyss, mm. a desolate place, mm -hmm. right? So we shared this example a little bit earlier in one of our other presentations, but we go through this process often in our homes. You put the garbage out every day. You know the garbage, your house is clean, but the garbage is still with you. There's still a memory of the garbage. Right. One day of the week, that day, you know that you got to get all the garbage out to the garbage to the front because the garbage truck is going to come and take all that garbage and take it out into a right. desolate place. Right. And then you never have to worry about that sin again. Well, guess what? That's what the Day of Atonement is all about, is Christ removing from us even the memory of sin. You see, when we sin, we ask for forgiveness, but we still remember the sin. Mm. Why? Because the sins are recorded in the temple. All right. The sins are recorded in, in the temple. My head is itching here. Oh. <laughs> in the temple. Uh-huh. Yeah? Uh-huh. So God ultimately wants to remove sin from the temple. Well, when does that happen? It happens when our high priest gathers all those sins and places them on the scapegoat. When that happens, there's going to come a time where the people of God at the end of time will be trying to recall their sins to confess them and they will not be able to recall it mm. because the sins have been removed from the temple. The sanctuary has been fully cleansed. And what does Christ say? I'm going to take those sins and I'm going to blot them out. I'm going to blot them out in the sea of forgetfulness. Mm. Well, guess where the sea of forgetfulness is? Yeah. It's the lake of fire, which Satan bears those sins into. Wow. Now, what do you say to people who say that's blasphemous? That the, Satan... The scapegoat that Satan is going to bear the sins. Yeah. Jesus bore our sins. Yeah. How do you respond to that? So Jesus was sacrificed for our sins. Right. The scapegoat is not sacrificed for the sins. The, sa the scapegoat will be punished for those sins. Okay. So in other words, if you look at the, the text in Leviticus itself that talks about the scapegoat, Aaron was to choose between these two goats. One was the Lord's goat. Mm. Okay. That sounds good. The Lord's goat. The other, the scapegoat. Well, if the other is not the Lord's goat, that's just not a good thing. Right? So one is for the Lord. The other is not for the Lord. So this indicates to us that the scapegoat is definitely not the Lord's goat. It is something other than the Lord's goat. It is Satan will be punished. All the sins that he has led God's people to commit will be rolled back upon his head. And he will be punished for those sins. He will be punished for those sins. So this cleansing of the sanctuary process begins at the 2300 day prophecy. And remember, this is the exact thing God in heaven realize, not realizes, but moves from the time of mercy to the time of war to a time of cleansing, where ultimately Satan is what cast out into a desolate place. Mm -hmm. um, Within this context of the, the, of the cleansing of the sanctuary, which is still going on now, there are several things that occur. The little horn, we're told, Satan will, this little horn power will seek to sit. Remember how in heaven the Bible says Satan wanted to sit on the sides of the north? Yes. So the sides of the north is a very interesting term. Uh, <clears throat> in the sanctuary, the table of showbread is said to be on the sides of the north. Hmm. And the significance of that is that in Psalm 48, verse 2, the Bible tells us that the city of the great king is on the sides of the north. In Isaiah 14, we're told that Lucifer wanted to sit on the sides of the north, on the mount of the congregation. He wanted to exalt his throne above the stars of God. So obviously, the sides of the north points to God as creator, as the king but specifically as creator. Why? The reason why is because on the table of showbread were 12 loaves of bread, okay? And the priest was to tend to those loaves of bread every Sabbath. 
So the table of showbread brings our attention to the Sabbath. Mm. The Sabbath points to Christ as the creator. So when Lucifer was saying, I want to sit on the sides of the north, what he's actually saying is, I want to be recognized as the creator. Mm -hmm. And how does he seek to do that? By exercising authority over the Sabbath. Hmm. When he sits over the Sabbath, claiming to have power to change. Remember what the priest did every, Sab every Saturday? They changed. Mm -hmm. When Lucifer sits in a position where he claims to have authority to change the Sabbath, he's sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And sets up a counterfeit. And sets up a counterfeit huh. and commands all to worship. We believe that Satan is going to appear as Christ himself. And when he appears as Christ himself, multitudes are going to be deceived. Mm -hmm. And in his assumed appearance, he will, he will, uh, he will, he will say that he has, he is the one that has changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, mm -hmm. and he will command all to worship. Mm -hmm. Something else that's very interesting is that God's law was written on blue stone. Uh, sapphire stone, which is blue. So God, God's commandments were written on blue stone. So I like to call his commandments his blueprint. Oh, okay. Right? Uh-huh. And, uh -huh. or we can say this, God's law is blue. Uh-huh. God has a blue law. Uh-huh. God has a blue law. Ooh. Wow. God has a blue law. The, 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 the color blue represents obedience. So the blue symbolize remember the commandments. So it would not be far fetched to understand then that Satan will also try to introduce a blue law, mm. but a counterfeit blue law. What's really interesting is that when you look at the attributes that we're to avoid in the, in the book of Revelation, we're to avoid the mark, uh, we're to avoid the worship of the beast, mm -hmm. his, uh, his image, his name and his mark. Those four things point to the first four commandments. Worship the dragon or have no other gods before me. Mm. Don't take the name of the, uh, the, the, I mean, don't worship graven images. The second, uh, the, the beast and his image. Mm. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Who, whosoever receives the beast's name. So the mark we know must be a counterfeit of the fourth commandment, mm. which is a counterfeit blue law. Okay, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about that mm -hmm. much more, but um, what you have happening is the time of trouble comes and then Jesus returns. Okay, and when Jesus returns, guess what happens? Revelation 20, the Bible tells us that uh, Lucifer is cast out into where? Earth. A, a desolate place. Oh. Wow. Wait a minute. Oh, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of from the, the, yeah. the beginning war. Yeah, you're yeah, thinking yeah. Of, So look what happened. Yeah. In heaven, a time of mercy, a time of war, war and a, time of, a time of cleansing, and then Lucifer is cast out into a desolate place. Hmm. Wow. Guess what happens on earth? 70 weeks, a time of mercy. 1260, a time of war. 2300, a time of cleansing. And then Lucifer is cast out mm. into a redesolated earth. That's right, for a thousand years. For a thousand years. Mm -hmm. And what's going to be happening at that time? God, Jesus, when he comes again, is going to resurrect the dead. And humanity goes into jury duty mm -hmm. to begin the judgment of Lucifer. Mm -hmm. And it is after this judgment that Sabbatismos returns to all of the universe. So it's like this. When mankind enters into heaven for jury duty, mm -hmm. they are prepared to judge why because they have lived through a replica of the great controversy in heaven. We've been through it. Yeah. We've experienced it firsthand. And then they've observed it again. Absolutely. 
Huh. Angels stage in he- by stage. Stage by. So angels in heaven have observed it a second time. Mm-hmm. We get it now. Mm-hmm. We understand. We see where this was going. Mm-hmm. We get it. R- righteous humanity. That has the, the jury. Get up to heaven. We've seen it. We lived through it. And it's as though God is allowing us to go through this experience. You know, we, we wonder, what must it have been like to be in heaven? We're living through it. Mm. We're living through that rebellion. We're living through that great controversy, which is why we call it the great controversy part two. Mm-hmm. Now, this is, this is absolutely amazing. Let's look at it again. Time of mercy. Mm-hmm. No. Uh, time of peace. Mm-hmm. Sabbatismos. Followed by time of mercy. Time of... War. War, time of cleansing, cleansing. Uh, Lucifer is cast yeah. out into a desolate place to be judged by newly created humanity. Mm. Lucifer says, we're going to mess that plan up. <laughs> <laughs> ha, 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 ha. God says, no problem. We'll just do it again. Mm-hmm. Time of mercy, time of war, time of cleansing. Lucifer, you're cast out again into a redesolated earth Mm -hmm. to be judged by newly recreated humanity. Mm. Restored. Restored. So sin Mm -hmm. caused a 6,000 year detour Mm. in this plan. Satan thought, ha ha, I've messed it all up. God says, we'll just do it again. And he does the exact thing again, bringing Lucifer right back to being cast out to a desolate earth wow. to, be recre- to be judged by newly recreated jurors. Wow. That's what I said. Wow. When you, when you got that insight, when the Holy Spirit gave you that insight, what was your reaction? Uh, just uh, amazed. You know, that the word of God is this, you know, we often think, you know, I mean, there's only one way to show the great controversy or there's only one way to. And I, I believe that God is trying to show us from like a thousand different angles that we have not believed cunningly devised fables. Mm -hmm. When we take the principles of God, the principles of Christ, you know, and, and see that, yes, if Christ is going to be Christ, he had to have offered Lucifer a time of mercy. There had to be a message in heaven saying to Lucifer, look, fear God and give glory to him. Don't worship yourself. Give glory to him. Mm-hmm. There had to be a message going out to the angels. Hey, Lucifer has fallen. Don't listen to his lies. Don't listen to him. Don't take his merchandise. There had to be a message in heaven saying, look, if any angel worships the dragon, they're going to be cast out into outer darkness. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're literally looking at the reliving of the great controversy and seeing that theme played out again. It's like God trying to show us, I'm preparing you for something. Yes. I'm preparing you for the judgment. You need this information for jury duty. You can't just come in a jury duty like, okay, so no, you actually need this information. I'm preparing you for jury duty and what I'm allowing you to go through as a people. So there'll be people from every, like we didn't go through the 70 weeks. We understand it here, right. but there'll be a part of the jury that lived through that 70 week period. Right. You see what I'm saying? So right. in every part of history, God has representatives from every stage of history to make up the entire jury. Wow. Wow. It, it, to me, it's just mind blowing. That is amazing because, it, again, it attests to God's character, his desire that that his justice be shown. His character is vindicated by this. Absolutely. Because no, no angel could look at God and say he's not fair. Right. Or he just, you know, he, he could have wiped Lucifer out like that mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. with a thought. Yep. But he didn't. He allowed everything to transpire only to bring Lucifer back, Satan, <laughs> back to that yeah. point of origin. We're bringing you right back here. Man. You, you think you just messed it all up? We're bringing it right back here. Man. I mean, for him to be cast out again. Yes. Into a desolate place. Where? This earth. Yes. No, not, not out in the universe somewhere. That's right. This earth. We, we're just going to start it over, Lucifer. That's right. With we're just no gonna ru- one to talk to, no one to tempt. That's right. Thousand years, just him. That's right. Wow. That's right. I had never thought about it like that. Yeah. 
it starts the cycle. It starts the cycle. So all sin is, is a 6,000 year detour of the planet. I mean, we don't know how long, you know, we, we're not told how long this, you know, if Lucifer had overcome, I mean, if Adam and Eve had, had resisted Lucifer's temptation, you know, okay, what would have happened then? How long would it have been before? You know, we don't know all those details. But what we do know is that man fell. And God allows. Satan thinks he's messing up God's plan. And God says, look, wait, wait on it. And, and the other thing is, he's showing, you know the verse, thy will be done on earth as mm -hmm. it is in heaven? Mm -hmm. That verse is twofold. Because Satan was trying to get his will done. What you're seeing in this controversy mm -hmm. is Satan trying to get his will done on earth as it was in heaven. Mm. So the battle we're having on earth is whose will is being done. Hmm. Whose will of what was being done in heaven is being reflected on earth. So we are reflecting somebody's will in heaven. The question is, is it Satan's or is it God's? Wow. Wow. Because Satan's will in heaven has now just been unfolded to us. We see what he did. You know, I, w I remember reading about this little horn. Mm -hmm. And just throughout the years, every time I'd read, I'd be like, man, this is crazy. Because it wouldn't happen at all the time. But I would just think, oh, he ca his tail casts a third of the stars to the ground. That's the dragon. But look, the little horn cast down the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. That's Daniel 8. Isn't that interesting? The little horn... And the dragon looks like they did. And then I just like go on. Uh -huh, and, and then when it was like, wait a minute, look at that more closely. And you begin to look through all the attributes of the little horn during the dark ages. And you're like, this is a reflection of Satan's will in heaven. This is exactly what he was doing in heaven. Cast down to the truth to the ground. He practiced and prospered. He was merchandising in heaven. All mm. these things. And you're going, is that a coincidence mm. or what? Mm. And in fact, um, you know, Lucifer was severed from heaven because of his rejection. That, that 70 week prophecy. Mm -hmm. Remember when the, when the Jews said, uh, we have no king but Caesar? Mm -hmm. Okay. The, the word Caesar, according to Thayer's um, dictionary, the word Caesar means cut off. Mm. So when they said, we have no king but Caesar, it's as though they were saying, we have no king but the severed one. Wow. And I look at that and I'm like, this is exactly what happened to Lucifer in heaven. He severed himself from God at the end of that 70 times seven, at mm. the end of that period of mercy. When he said, I haven't done anything wrong. Mm -hmm. I have done no wrong. Mm -hmm. And as a result, he was severed. So it's like a mirror image that we're looking at. This is the great, we are living the great controversy part two. Right. The great controversy part one happened there in heaven. And so as we're able to see, and, and that's why I say, these prophecies are just as much of a revelation for the angels. In other words, they are as much like, we've seen this before. We, I mean, imagine them in heaven. We have seen this before. Why, are they gonna do the same thing? Is it gonna happen? And this is what solidifies their, yep, sin, wherever it is manifested, has the same pattern. Oh, yes. Has the same pattern. Yes, yes. So now we get to see it, the angels see it, and when the judgment hits, there's no question. There's no deliberation like, well, you know, there's no hung juries. Yeah. No, there's no Satan's advocate. I think you guys are being yeah. a little bit too hard on Satan, you know? It is clear. It's clear. This is so rich, and I'm so, I'm so grateful for this information. What are some parting thoughts that you want to leave with the viewers? What, what, do you, what kind of summary can you give? You know, I think the most important thing for our viewers to get is that uh, Christ is seeking to cleanse the temple. Mm. Remember, here's where the record of sin is. And if we hold on to sin in the temple, um, the temple will, it will itself eventually be left desolate. God's ideal for us is for him, for us to be a dwelling place for him. That's the gospel message. Remember that we're, we're not one to God. We're not saved because, oh man, I'm keeping the commandments now and I'm, and I'm doing everything right. 
because we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Don't be like Lucifer. I haven't done any, anything wrong. Uh, don't be rich and increase with goods with need of nothing. Mm-hmm. You look at those seven churches, it talks about that first church starting out perfect but lost its first love. That's exactly what happened with Lucifer. And he ends up like the seventh church, rich and increased with goods, need of nothing, and God spewed him out of his mouth. Mm-hmm. So we need to realize, you know, I'm wretched, miserable, naked, and blind. Lord, write your law in me. Get, I want to be under your mercy. And then help me to be a tent maker. After you clean me up, Lord, help me to go put up another tent. Help me to be like Paul. Mm-hmm. Help me to, to bring others into a knowledge of who they are. To let them know they are jurors. God has called them to, to jury duty. Mm-hmm. Don't skip jury duty. Because <laughs> right. only jurors are going to make it to heaven, right? So help me to know the difference between right and wrong, good and evil. Help me not to argue the devil's stuff because I disqualify myself. Help me. Help me to be a sound juror standing for Christ. Amen. And to, and to recognize Jesus yes. and, and his role and his love for us mm. and his desire to save us if we just submit to him, yes. if we'll just give our, our lives over to him. Amen. Thank you so much for being Amen. with us. Thank you. What a blessing. Thank and Thank we look you. forward to having you again. And as we mentioned before, if you want Pastor Myers to come to your church, he is available to come. He will give you these insights. Um, You know what? I need to tell you about our free offer again, just so you know, if you really want this free offer of, is it easier to be saved or to be lost? Call us at 618-627-4651 and request this free offer. Thank you so much for joining us. May God bless you. May he richly bless and keep you as you serve him.